So we are live. Thank you everyone for coming to the session. Um, let's just start with this uh, little welcome video for you. Hello everyone. Welcome to Open Security Summit 2020. I hope you are enjoying your sessions. So we we have over 90 sessions this Thank week. It's quite a busy week. Um, Whether you're watching this live or on YouTube, we, will, we would like to welcome you to Open Security Summit. All the sessions are either live streamed to YouTube or recorded and then shared onto YouTube and on our website as well. If you want to preserve your anonymity, please rename yourself in the Zoom, the Zoom uh, window now. This is what our YouTube channel is looking like right now. It's quite a busy channel. Um, there will be lots of sessions uh, ongoing at the same time. So if you're missing any of them, feel free to go back and uh, check, uh, check and um, watch them. Uh, OSS 2020 is our hashtag this year. Uh, please do use it uh, on social media and let everyone know what you think about the sessions. Um, we have made it easier to join the Zoom sessions via our uh, OpenSecretarySummit.org website. So when you go to the site, you can just click on uh, the session name and join by Zoom. We have some amazing tracks. I'm sure you have already looked into them. Uh, there are lots of tracks and I said more than 90 sessions. So if you haven't checked all of them, go ahead and uh, have a look. We start every day at 10.30 with a keynote. Then we have uh, sessions until uh, 10 p.m. UK time. It's quite a nice schedule. Um, and yeah, you can, you can see lots of sessions happening at the same time and from many different experts in their fields. Openness and respect. So, as, as I said before, everything is recorded, but openness is not just about recording the stuff. Openness is about sharing with each other, recording the outcomes so that other people who don't have this chance to join these sessions can build up on the knowledge that we have shared here. And that is very, very important for us. And um, we will be using all the functionality of Zoom. Uh, please use the chat functionality. Um, and if you have any burning questions, you can unmute and ask the organizers as well. If we are live on the YouTube, uh, our host, your host, will be monitoring both chat windows in Zoom and YouTube. You can also use the yes, no buttons in the participants window. So that is useful when, when it uh, when the organizers ask a question and you can just easily answer them. Uh, dear organizer, um, if you haven't done so, please uh, tell your host about the note taker so that uh, the right document will be shared with them. Your host will also uh, give you a nudge around the last 15 minutes to focus on the outcomes document and to do a five minute, up to five minutes debrief towards the end. So this, this is the summit. So if you haven't been to one before, they were all on site before and it was a really, really uh, high energy collaborative environment. You would have to participate. It, it, the energy would have um, taken you away. So please don't be shy. We all learn from each other and the more we participate, the more value we create together. We do know you care deeply, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And um, yeah, by participating and asking questions um, and discussing the stuff, you will, uh, you will enable all of us to take this industry a bit further. And as we were saying about respect and diversity, so this is a very diverse community. Um, we are coming from all different walks of life and different backgrounds. And without each other, we wouldn't have survived. This community wouldn't have survived. So uh, please respect each other. Yeah, and I said before, OSS 2020 is the um, hashtag. And we also have a Slack community where the discussions continue all year round rather than just at the uh, 
Summit time. And your host will be sharing the details of these in the chat window in a minute. And thank you, that is all from me. Over to you. Okay. Thank you for bearing with us for this welcome video, five minutes. Uh, it is now a 32 past, so um, I, without further ado, the man himself, Simon Wardley, um, for the keynote for the uh, second day of the summit. Thank you thank for you. being with us. Oh, thank you. And thank you very much for that, uh, uh, the introduction as well. And uh, so we've got 28 minutes and I've got far too many slides to go through, as is normal. So go I better get started. Right, let's get going. Hang on, better share my screen. Da, 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 da. Let's make sure I get the right, click on the right thing. There we go. Let's expand this so it's uh, full screen into full screen. Perfect. Can can you see big word mapping um, across the screen? Does that look look right? Yes. Fantastic. So what am I going to talk about? Um, I'm going to talk about some basics, which I'm sure everybody's covered, but just in case, uh, just quickly cover a few basics. Then I'm going to talk today about doctrine, and then I'm going to talk about something called order. Okay, so the quick basics, where did this all start? It started with me uh, being a CEO of a company and absolutely not having a clue what I was doing. So the company's very successful, very profitable. Uh, this is 2005, and I, but I'm making it all up. I'm a fake CEO. And so, as I've said before, we had, uh, you know, vision statements and things like this. So our strategy is customer focused. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source uh, to become a leading provider of blah, 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 blah. Um, the problem with this is this was just words that I pinched from another company and just changed a few things. And so I'm sort of getting worried that people would rumble. So I used to go around recording CEOs talking about strategy, recorded all the short words that I called them business level abstractions about healthy strategy that they used. And here are the common blowers. I've done this every few years. So uh, this was 2013, 2014. Uh, common blowers, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, et cetera, or blah, blah, blah. And if you did it today, um, you'd hear the same words, but with machine learning, AI, blockchain, and things like that. Um, and so I created a blah template. Our strategy is blah. We will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. Then I smashed the blahs and the blah templates together, auto-generated 64 random strategies. Uh, things like this. Our strategy is customer-focused. Uh, we will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data oh, to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. Uh, things like this. Our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of blah, blah, blah. And then I just send these out. And last time, 400 of responses, three basic types. This is the exact wording from our business plan. Two, I've seen two of these used already. And three, are you for hire? So there I am, CEO of this company, making everything up, and I'm starting to get the impression, or I certainly was back then, that other people were making it up as well. Uh, and if you ever want a strategy, by the way, a friend of mine's put this all online. Uh, this is strategy mad, uh, mad with, just, just type the URL, it will automatically generate you a strategy based on nothing whatsoever. So our strategy is collaborative, we will leave an open effort of the market. If you want to pretend there's AI and machine learning and blockchain or whatever else, big data behind it, go ahead. It's just slamming a few words into a template. And if you don't like the strategy, it's really simple, just press refresh and keep on going until you get one. So. There I was, um, very confused over the whole field of strategy. Uh, I walked into a bookseller. They, they you know, being, um, they, they sold me a book. In fact, two books. Uh, they persuaded me to read Sun Tzu, two different versions of it because they're translations. And what I noticed was Sun Tzu talked about five factors that matter in competition. And this made sense to me. Have a purpose, a moral imperative, understand your landscape, understand the climactic patterns to how the landscape is changing, understand doctrine and principles of organization, and finally get into the whole leadership bit. And then I came across John Boyd, US Air Force pilot, uh, famous for OODA loops. So basically, you've got the game, your purpose, 
you observe the environment, so that's landscape and climatic patterns, so that's the landscape and how it's changing. You orientate yourself around this with principles, then you decide where you're going to attack, and then you, you manipulate the spaces to your favor and you act, and, and, and that's all about gameplay. And within this, there are two whys, the why of purpose and the why of movement. So the why of purpose is a uh, you know, moral imperative. The why of movement is do I move this space, uh, space or this space? And it's through constantly going around this cycle uh, that we, we get better at playing the game. All right, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. So uh, the why of movement, just to explain a little bit more on the why of purpose with chess, uh, your why of purpose might be to win the game. Your why of movement is do I move piece A or piece B? And it's through movement and action that we actually learn. So if I move piece B, you know, you know, I move the queen, it's checkmate, yay. Um, but learning depends upon us actually perceiving and understanding the environment. And this is why understanding your landscape, uh, situational awareness and things like maps are so important. Uh, they're not just about communication, they're also about learning. So, so that's some pretty much basics. Um, and I started to explore this a bit more, and I, I use the example of chess. I'm going to stick with this for a bit. Um, I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess, but no one's ever seen a chessboard. So it's very simple. The way you play the chess is you've got these characters on a screen, and you press a button like pawn. Uh, your opponent sees what you've pressed, and they press a button like pawn. Uh, you see what they've pressed, and you press a button like pawn. They see what you've pressed and you, uh, and anyway, it goes on for ages until somebody wins or more likely a draw. Now, what's gonna happen is after thousands of these games, somebody's gonna put this into a big data system or hundreds of thousands and come up with magic secrets of success. So if you press, I don't know, knight, I should respond with poor knight rook or whatever it happens to be. And we'll write books on this, the, the secret of the, uh, uh, the queen, uh, the magic of the knight or whatever it happens to be. And then I'm gonna play a game of chess against somebody who's a total novice. But unbeknownst to me, they see something truly magical. Uh, they, they see the board, so the map, the landscape. And so I move a piece, pawn, uh, they counter, pawn. I move a piece, pawn, uh, they counter, queen, it's checkmate. And I'm sitting there thinking, what happened? How did I lose that game? I mean, you know, what are the fiddlesticks? So, First thing I'm going to do, write down the secret, the, that sequence. It's obviously a magic secret of success, um, but when I use it, they're going to beat me. So now I'm going to think maybe it's the speed at which they press the button. And um, that's not going to help me. They're still going to beat me. Now I think it's cultural. Maybe they're a happy sort of person. Uh, that's not going to help me. They're still going to beat me. So basically, um, I'm going to lose. And they're going to get better the more they play the game. And the problem is, is they have high situational awareness. So when it came, came to business, the question for me is, you know, what do you use, context-specific play, understand the landscape or secrets of success? Well, in my business, it was all secrets of success. I was like reading all the wonderful articles, you know, top 10 secrets of CEOs, top 10 secrets of successful people, you know, big earlobes, get up early in the morning, whatever it happened to be. Um, and, and so that's the world I was in. And I wanted to be in this world of context-specific play. Now that requires maps. And I had loads of maps, my maps, uh, business process maps, systems maps, but they all had a problem. If I took a system map like this one for one of our lines of business and I took CRM, customer relationship management and moved it, it doesn't change the map, still the same. Now, if I take an atlas and shift Australia and put it next to England, that does change the atlas. Now, the reason why it doesn't change this map is quite simply, it's not a map. I'm afraid that's a word we keep on using and it doesn't mean what we think it means. Most things in business we call maps are in fact graphs. Now to explain the difference, three graphs at the top, they're identical. Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover, they are exactly the same. The three maps at the bottom are completely different. So the difference between a map and a graph is simply that space has meaning. So if I move a, in a map where Dover is, it changes the meaning of that map. In a graph, I can move it left and right. As long as I keep the connections the same, it makes no difference. So the key thing is space has meaning and which enables us to go and explore. So where does that meaning come from? And it's fairly simple. 
Uh, all maps have some basic characteristics. A, you have an anchor, a point of reference like magnetic north. B, you have the position of pieces relative to the anchor. So this is north, south, east or west of that. And lastly, you have consistency of movement. So if I want to go from London to Dover, I want to go southwest. And southwest doesn't mean north. It doesn't mean northeast. Of course, if I go southwest from London, you know, I discover that Dover isn't actually there. Uh, Dover's more over here. So oh, and, that, and even that's not right. But uh, this is the point about maps. They're all imperfect representations. And it, by exploring and traveling across them, we can learn and improve the map. Right, so a very quick example, because uh, I often do a cup of tea, um, because I like cups of tea. This is a tea shop. So public has a need uh, for a cup of tea, business has a need to sell cups of tea. So I've got two anchors at the top, two points of reference, the public and, and, and business. Now I've got cups of tea and cups of tea have needs. So a cup of tea needs hot water, needs cold water, it needs an unvitui, and it needs power. So what I've got is a chain of needs. So this needs this, a cup of tea needs tea, it needs a cup, etc. cetera. Um, so what I've got is a chain of needs. And so to the public, you know, the cup of tea is more visible to them than the power that's used in the process of making hot water to make the cup of tea. So visibility is a metaphor for distance. I, something is far away or near, for, near to us, I, near, it's very visible. So now what I've got is an anchor and position described through visibility. Now, all of these components evolve. Um, so, you know, they start off with a genesis, then you get custom built examples, products and very much commodity items. So tea, hot water, power, these are all commodity type things. OK, now, once you start to understand the landscape, you start to learn climactic patterns and you start to learn doctrine. And most of this talk is going to be about the issue of doctrine because it comes up so many times. Um, as Kat Sweetall says, you know, Wardley mapping does not equal uh, Wardley maps. It's, it's much bigger than that. I mean, if I'm the thought lord, uh, uh, Kat is the uh, thought uh, empress. There we are. So, uh, and, and Kat is absolutely spot on with this statement. So I've covered the basics. Now I want to get a little bit more into doctrine. So doctrine are these universally useful principles uh, that come out of maps. And if you've read any of my stuff, you'll find various doctrine tables and they're normally a complete mess and difficult to decipher. Um, that's because I'm fairly useless uh, in graphics and English and things like that. Uh, fortunately, um, Steve Perkis, uh, he's a friend of mine, is much better at this stuff. So he took a couple of my tables of doctrine, one which was categorizing by things like whether it's communication or development, and one by phase of implementation and simplified the whole lot. And I've taken that in the way that I do and modified it slightly. And so this is my new doctrine table. So you've got a map and that, that map has the components of the, uh, uh, the landscape and those components will evolve through common economic patterns or climactic patterns and that's useful for anticipation. But one of the things you have to do is orientate yourself around the space with principles. And this is where doctrine comes in. And these are all the basically use, universally useful principles that have come out of mapping. So I'm gonna go through just a couple of them. And we're gonna start with the phase one. Then these are the most simplest ones to implement. Have a common language, challenge assumptions, understand what is being considered, know your users, focus on user needs, remove bias and duplication, use appropriate methods, know the details, and a bias towards de uh, uh, data. Pretty simple stuff. Well, it sounds pretty simple. Okay, let's start with a common language. So if I've got a map like this, I can share it with others, and other people can go, oh, you're missing staff. You know, and somebody can say, oh, actually, staff should be more robots. Or somebody from finance can say each of these are actually stocks of capital. And these are flows of capital. And onto this, we can start building PL. So one of the beauties that I found, find about maps, it, is, it doesn't matter if somebody comes from development or operations or sales or finance, we can all describe and talk about the same environment using this common language of a map. The second thing to do is to challenge assumptions. So if I think about that map of the tea shop and I'm looking at it, and yes, I've got people talking about, you know, the different users and the different components. I just, I don't just accept it, I challenge it. You know, I might go, what's a, 
and Vutwi. And well, why are we uh, we custom building it? I, I I know it's got something to do with power and it creates hot water. I mean, you're not talking about a kettle, are you? And of course, Mvutwi is Klingon for kettle. So, so let's replace that with kettle. And, and now we can say, well, hang on a minute. Shouldn't we be using standard kettles? Now, there may be a reason why we're not. Somebody from marketing might say, well, there's brand exclusivity. Because we can actually do the financial figures now, we can actually work out what the cost is associated with that brand exclusivity. So what we're doing now is a process of challenging the assumptions we're making in making our map. Now, it's a really difficult area, challenging assumptions. And uh, the reason why, very simply, uh, this is Vikings. This is how Vikings used to navigate, uh, the use of stories, epic stories. So from Herman Head due west towards half, and, and that epic story, it was a massive story, basically means this, okay? Now, if you ask the question, what would you use to navigate, visual map or verbal story? Well, if it's a short journey, I'll use a verbal story. If it's a more complex, I'll use a visual map. But there's a problem with verbal stories. If I'm giving you the verbal story, if you question my verbal story, I tend to get annoyed. And I tend to get annoyed because you're, you're challenging not just the story, but the storyteller. We spend an enormous amount of time in business explaining that good leaders are great storytellers. And the reason why your great idea didn't work is not because it was a terrible idea, but because you didn't sell it in the right way. So every time you challenge a story, you're challenging the person. So if I take a map of a Roman town, there's 30 points of interest on that town, each connected by single paths, so no combination, otherwise, you know, it'd be just huge amounts of data, just single paths with 25 words, that's 20,000 words, just to describe the single paths for those are 30 odd points. Well, if I give you a journey to go from A to B, I do path one, path two, path three, path four, and you look at that on a map, you might go, well, actually, there's a faster way of doing this. And the thing is, I'm not gonna get so offended. The reason being is you're not telling me I'm wrong, you're telling me that the map, that the path on the map is wrong. So that's one of the beauties about maps is, is enables you to challenge assumptions. Okay, so the next one is understand what is being considered. So my favorite example of this is insurance company, process flow, uh, needed compute, order server, server comes to goods in, modify mount bracket. They had a bottleneck uh, with modification and mounting of servers. They spent six months, huge amount of money, going to uh, spend uh, on robotics to get rid of this bottleneck. 15 minute discussion, they map it. User, compute, order server, server goods in, rack mount, modify. Now, it's pretty simple. I'm not challenging their idea of robotics. I'm now just challenging the map because the obvious question is, why have you got rack and custom built? And the answer was they had custom built racks and the modifications they're doing to servers is because servers didn't fit into their custom built racks. That's why they need to take cases off, drill new holes, add new plates, and that's why they need robotics. Now, obviously, the sensible idea is to use standard racks, but people get trapped by their context, the stories they believe in. And this is probably the most common example I see. Um, people focusing on process flow when they should be focusing on evolutionary flow. Uh, so robotics would get you making that process more efficient. The reality, you don't need that process at all. Okay, the next two are focus on users and focus on user needs. Sounds pretty obvious. Uh, when, we, when I wrote the better for less paid for the UK government, which led to things like spend control, one of the things that we used to go around with is what is the user need? I mean, it seems daft to say, you know, do you know who your users are? But it's incredible the number of systems where people haven't focused on who the users are and what their needs are. Now, sometimes those needs change. So if we think about conferences at the moment, um, user has a need to go to events, usually for reasons of social interaction and learning, and that required a physical space. Now, we've been able to provide virtual events for a long time but we've had inertia to do this because of those social interactions, the desire to meet, shake hands and all that sort of stuff. Now, we have a new need because of COVID, uh, which is the physical isolation. And that is what's driving us towards this virtual space. Uh, it's the same with New York City, uh, turn of the 20th century. Entire city, you know, the, 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 on the left-hand side, those are piles of horse manure. There are so many horses um, and 
that need to deal with this is why the, the entire city so quickly adopted the automotive when it became available. All right. So we've got a forcing function to create uh, events in a virtual space. And of course that uh, means that new pathways are possible, but the most interesting bit, it also creates new emerging practice and new needs. You saw this with cloud when we shifted from product to utility and you've got things like DevOps, Netflix. Okay. Now, if I'm a business, um, you know, I'm an actor. And so you shouldn't just draw the user, you draw the other actors as well. And I may have self-interest in events in a physical space. And of course, I'm gonna desire for things to return back. But those aren't the only other. I used to think these were the only actors in this map. And um, then Petra pointed out, actually COVID is an actor because COVID has a need for users. It needs people to be susceptible to COVID and it has a need for social interaction, not isolation um, in that physical world. So the point about this is you can map multiple users and multiple different uh, components uh, but start with the uh, user needs and also remember those needs change over time. Okay, the next one is remove bias and duplication. Super simple, emergency services mobile communication platform, 600 page specification, ask them what's the user need, nobody knows. So got them to quickly map it, user, oh, well, they did know it was in the specification somewhere but no one could easily point to it. So, so got them to map it, user needs emergency function, point to multiple point communication, point to point, great stuff. And then it has all these underlying components which are needed in building these sort of core critical infrastructure. Now the beauty about having a map like this is I can share it. And so when I took maps and borders and immigration and police and we shared them, we started finding uh, there were common components. So like user registration, we'd have six of those, five thought it was a commodity, one thought it had to be custom built in their particular system. So what you start to discover by collecting maps is duplication and also bias. Now, I have to say, before anybody starts having a go at government being inefficient, uh, the worst I've ever found in government is 118 workflow systems doing exactly the same thing. In this case, registering prisoners into prisons. Uh, the worst I found in and the, uh, the, the private market is I've got a bank who's managed to build risk management over a thousand times. So anybody running around thinking, you know, the government is inefficient, you should be like the private sector, you really need to take a closer look at just how bad the private sector actually is. Right, so use appropriate methods, uh, another, another simple one. Things evolve, they become more efficient. They enable higher order systems to appear. These are climactic patterns. This is a pattern known as componentization. Uh, they, so electricity enables things like radio and television and that evolves. As these things evolve, their characteristics change from this uncharted chaotic space to the more industrialized. Doesn't matter, money, penicillin, computing, it's all the same goes from chaotic to, to more predictable. Because of that, there's no such thing as one size fits all methods. Extreme programming, very good on the left. Six Sigma, very good on the right. Lean, such as MVP, very good, uh, uh, sorry, Scrum plus MVP plus other artifacts, very good in the middle. One's about reducing cost of change. One's about learning and reducing waste. One's about reducing deviation. Now, of course, if you go to a conference and say that, you know, Agile doesn't fit everywhere or Six Sigma doesn't fit everywhere, depending upon the conference, it'll be burning heretic or, or whatever. It's the same with purchasing materials. No such thing as one size fits all. Time, material, outcome, more cots, more unit utility based. You have to use multiple. Now, worth giving you example, uh, James Finley, HS2, high speed rail. James Finley, by the way, his handle is GoAgileGov. You can find him on Twitter. So um, when building a, a, a high-speed rail, they decided to build the entire railway in a virtual world uh, because it's cheaper to dig up a virtual world, go, I've got it wrong, uh, than the real world. Now, the interesting thing about this project is it came under budget and ahead of schedule. So this is the systems diagram. And James's problem was, which bits do I outsource? What do I build with off the shelf? Which bits do I build in-house? How do I answer that question? there's actually 380 million odd permutations of just those three questions with that number of boxes. So he mapped it. There's the original map. He did this on a Sunday afternoon. He sent it to me. I just tied a few things up and now it's easy. I'll outsource the stuff on the right, off the shelf in the middle, agile in-house on the left-hand side, okay? Now vendors tend to hate this 
Uh, they tend to hate this because they want you to outsource everything. And they want you to outsource everything because you'll want a specification, because you want to know what's being delivered. Now, if you do that, you can guarantee that some bits, the right stuff on the right hand side will be efficiently treated and the bits on the left will incur excessive change control costs because they will change. And when you get into a fight with a vendor, it's all your fault because all the cost is the bits that you didn't specify correctly because you could never specify it correctly. OK. Um, of course, unfortunately, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're very unlucky, somebody on your side falls for this argument, says next time we need to specify it better. Just don't let them anywhere near any projects ever again. Um, now, one of the things that people do is they say, you know, surely Agile will be everywhere. Social practice theory, Professor Elizabeth Shaw, very quick explanation. Agile development has evolved because it's not just activities, but practices evolved to become good at building things in that new space, like agile teleportation, say. And teleportation will evolve, and Lean's become good, heading towards best practice for building in that middle space, Six Sigma, good at the right, okay? The problem is, we all call them project methodologies, they have a common meaning, but what you've got are three different competencies. And on the top, you've got a common meaning, which is um, uh, teleportation, and you've got three different material instances. And one competence is good for one material instance. You can never get one fit everywhere. Of course, we try to do it by mashing together different practices to come up with the all singing, all dancing practice, the agile, which works everywhere. And of course, when it fails, then we go around saying you use the wrong bits, you use the, uh, the less agile you didn't use the more six sigma bits of it or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it, it's beautiful process to see because Agile, a system which was all about uh, people over uh, process, has rapidly become a system of process over people. Anyway, you can learn more by following Chris and some sheep maturity mapping. Good stuff there. And the last one on this is a bias towards data. All right. Um, so, uh, do, 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 do. Ooh, oh, no, I jumped. Oh, it's sorry. Know the details. Right. This, 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 um, uh, this is a, a government agency weighing scales. So very, very simply department needs a count. Um, they need to count the number of paper forms. They get it from weighing scales. Uh, I, they weigh the paper forms to work out the number of paper forms because we produce so many and they want to do a digital transformation. So they, so they want to turn this into electronic scales. Sounds great. So then we quickly map it out. A paper form comes from Goods In, that comes from distribution sites all over the country. They've got printing facilities that are actually printing the forms out because the users are filling websites online. So users filling websites online, the distribution site prints it out in a paper form, sends the paper form to this agency, which weighs the paper forms to work out how many paper forms have been printed out to give the count of the number of users filling in the online service. It doesn't make any sense at all, but it made sense in the past when there weren't electronic records. All of this can be replaced by select count star from table. Same problem, they're optimizing process flow when really paper forms have evolved and that's the process they flow they should be using. Okay, the last one in my list in this tour de forces is bias towards data. Industry um, has shareholders. Uh, these uh, lines are actually bi-directional flows of capital. So you have investment, they have a return investment. Let's say the industry is the drug industry. So, so they have investment in drugs and they want to make a profit. Now, they get the revenue from consumers and there's costs associated with raw materials. Consumers obviously want standards. I, they want drugs that don't kill them, but there's a cost associated with that. Fortunately, uh, consumers are also voters, because if it was left to companies, it would just be a matter of insurance, you take your risks. Government, of course, um, needs voters, and therefore it pays for the regulators who create the standards. And the regulators themselves create all the legal framework, which makes sure the standards are applied. All good stuff. Works very well in a common market, free trade agreement. Problems start to break down when the raw materials come out from outside um, supply chains and other country standards because when there is a problem in the supply chain, we need to get access to it and that data can be very, very expensive. So what do you do? Well, you do an open effort, for example, around standards. So you want to push other countries to the same standards, okay? Pretty simple. And the point about this is this, you do a pre-mortem on your project, create the map, decide what you're gonna do, and then you do a post-mortem 
uh, once you've done the project to see what the effect was. And this is what a biased board's data means. So when, you know, in government, we used uh, Wardley mapping, um, you know, single projects uh, saved hundreds of millions, or in this case, 1.5 billion in its lifetime. You start off by mapping the space and looking at what the impact is, is, is uh, what you anticipate the impact is going to be pre-mortem and then do a post-mortem afterwards. So that's basics and that's doctrine and very, very quickly now into order. Here is my doctrine table and I've ordered it into phase one, two and three and four. Very simply, by saying that this needs this needs this. So I've actually mapped each of those uh, uh, practices themselves. Now the reality is many companies or some web engineering companies are pretty good at this stuff. They're good at certain things, weak in other areas. Uh, but in other industries like the financial services, they're dreadful at the lot. They don't know their users, don't know their user needs and so forth. And the reality is it doesn't matter because it's okay to be hopeless at doctrine as long as all your other competitors are hopeless as well. Your only problem is when somebody comes in who's, who's better at this stuff because they'll tend to be more adaptable. Now, how do we know this? Uh, if I just look at understand what is being uh, considered and a bias towards open. Uh, this is a piece of work which I did in 2012. Uh, looking at the level of strategic play against use of open techniques. It's 160 companies. The bigger the bubbles, the more companies. You don't need to look at really worry about this. All that matters is that if execution, action ruled, the companies on the right would be doing better. If awareness ruled, the companies at the top would be doing better. And this is the market cap changes over a seven year period. And what this is simply saying is that awareness and action matter. So understanding you know what is being good and in this case action was about the use of open and a bias towards open matter but do they matter more than using appropriate methods and using appropriate tools and the answer is we don't know okay all maps are imperfect representations of a space i'm afraid and i do have a map of mapping which is an imperfect representation of mapping itself and the doctrine is very much in the custom built stage so we don't know yet as we go along, as we get better at this, we'll give you better doctrine tables. They're the best that we've got at the moment. So to quick recap, I said about the basics of mapping, talked about doctrine, talked about the order. Um, the takeaway messages for you is simply, you don't have to use maps of this, but focus on user needs, understand the details, think small, as in break it down into small components, use appropriate methods, you know, agile here, six sigma here, challenge assumptions I mean, you know just don't take a map and just question it um, and do actually question it and have a bias towards data so using things like pre-mortem post-mortems are a good idea another way of saying this all is, is cat was right um wardly mapping is much much bigger than just the maps you can do all that stuff without maps maps just simply help and at that point i will say thank you very much Thank you. Hello. What? How was that? <laughs> it was good. And five minutes over on. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. My my apologies for that. Well, we started a few minutes late, actually, yes. according to yes. my clock. So, yeah, I, no, I was about two minutes over. So sorry about that. Thank okay. you, Simon. I'm gutted I missed the beginning. I had to do something. <laughs> oh, well, it's on video uh, and everything else. And uh, uh, Petra, I included you in it as yeah. well. I, I mean, I've I heard. love that example. Sorry, I threw it in there. I just couldn't resist it. Uh, you know, I'm going to blame you, Petra. Well, I'm, I, I'm honoured. No. I'm just, I'm just honoured <laughs> that you threw me in there. So, um, yeah. That was great. Uh, well, the point about that is what's really interesting about that is that you, you know, from a uh, point of view on attack and a defense uh, viewpoint. If we take a map, you're going to have multiple actors. You could have the use of the business and whatever, but you can also have attackers as well. And so from uh, that's one of the things I like about map is, is taking on the offensive side. So often, you know, we're doing maps in terms of defense and terrorist. So, you know, the terrorists have certain needs. They, they want to, uh, you know, uh, they want to they need a payload and they need a, um, um, some sort of uh, a distribution mechanism. Uh, to put their payload in places we don't want to be. And so the defensive side is how you defend against those. So fascinating. I thought that was a really, really nice example. So yes, I threw it in there and threw a whole bunch of COVID and everything else. Cool. Thank you. I'm really and great. thank you, Petra, for your contribution. That was brilliant. So 
uh, we will need to end this one now. So that okay. one can start. Well, people will see you in a couple minutes. Pleasure. Take care. Thank you all.